So I'm going to talk to you about doing semantics with GPUs. Uh, and in the course of this, I'm going to talk a lot about doing semantics, and then a little bit about GPUs. Uh, because to understand why GPUs are so great for semantics, you kind of have to understand a little bit about semantics. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, cognitive computing platforms, which is something that you uh, may have heard a lot about lately. Uh, an IDC report came out re recently that forecast a $12.5 billion market by 2019. Uh, and by 2018, they predicted that half the consumers out there will regularly interact with cognitive computing services in some way. Sounds pretty impressive, but what does that mean? How is that uh, stuff going to work? Um, and what is cognitive computing anyhow? So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding uh, to, to the answers to those questions. Um, so when I tell people that I do language understanding using deep learning, I get a question a lot, which is, uh, which is more difficult, doing vision or doing language? Uh, and I think this is because people see uh, a lot of research out there with recognizing cats and videos and things like that, and there's a lot of vision research. Uh, and so maybe those people think that language isn't that interesting of a problem, it's mostly been done. After all, we have phones that we can talk to and cars, and so maybe uh, language understanding is just sort of a solved problem that is not really that interesting uh, anymore. Um, and I usually, annoyingly, answer that question with another question. Both things are very hard to do. Uh, but I just ask, look out there in nature and tell me how many creatures do you see that can see? And how many creatures do you see that can talk? Uh, and I think that gives you some sort of answer about how specialized language is uh, and how difficult of a problem it is, uh, even for nature. Now you might argue, well, there are, are lots of creatures out there that seem to have some kind of communication system. Uh, and that's, that's very true. But there are certain things that make humans very unique. Uh, one of them is that we're able to communicate in multiple modalities and switch back and forth between them very easily. We can gesture at something, uh, use you know, language and gesture at the same time. People who lose one modality are able to then shift into a different modality and do most of the same communication that we're able to do in that other modality. And that's something that you just, just don't really see uh, in the animal kingdom. Another thing is that we're able to embed and recurse over long sequences. So we're able to, to make up things like, uh, this is the rat that ate the mob that lay in the house that Jack built. Uh, and this shows a kind of ability for recursion that uh, you don't see in the communication in, in the animal kingdom. Uh, and this leads to what von Humboldt called the, the infinite use of finite means, uh, or what's sometimes, sometimes called discrete infinity. Uh, and that's just to say that we have a limited vocabulary, we have a limited uh, number of tokens that we can use in communication, but from that we're able to generate an unlimited and infinite set of uh, communicative utterances. Uh, you can just take a, a sentence like the last one and rehearse it over and over. Um, and whatever longest sentence you have, you can make an even longer one. So these three things, multimodal communication, recursion, and discrete infinity, seem to define what's sometimes called the human capacity for language. Um, and that human capacity is something that is unique to humans, and it seems to have only showed up in the evolutionary scale about 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, which is not very long ago. So something must have happened uh, not very long ago in the evolutionary time frame that gave us this, this capacity. So there are three possibilities. One is that we might have had some kind of change in the interface. Maybe we were able to pay attention to sounds and vocalizations much better than other creatures uh, are able to. Or maybe we have something in our larynx that allows us to talk and communicate in this way. Another possibility is maybe there's a different learning algorithm. Maybe suddenly evolution developed a different way for us to learn things that allowed us to, uh, to gain this capacity. Um, and the third possibility is architecture, that maybe our brains were just wired in a special way to allow this to happen. As far as the interface goes, people have done a bunch of experiments on that, and it turns out that uh, other, other chimps and creatures that don't communicate that we, the way that we do are able to hear things the way that we can, and so the interface doesn't seem very likely. The learning algorithm, we know uh, that neurons around the brain all work more or less the same way. There's a myelin sheath, there's potassium coming in and going out, and uh, so, so that seems like something that it's prevalent throughout the entire brain and also throughout species, so that doesn't seem like a very good place to go. Architecture, on the other hand, seems to be the place where uh, 
we might be able to find this human capacity. Um, and deep learning is great because it's something that we can use to play around with different architectures and see if we can get at these things uh, and, and do them in the way that humans are doing them. So just to give you an example of how architecture might work, uh, this is an early experiment that was done by Jeff Hinton back in the early to mid 80s. Um, and he was messing around with neural networks and different architectures. Uh, and the idea was to be able to recognize from sentences propositions like this, like uh, John hit Mary, uh, where you've got an agent who is John, Mary who's the patient or the person who's being hit, uh, and then you've got some kind of relation between them. Um, so to, to, in order to learn these kinds of things with neural networks, uh, Hinton set up these separate assemblies where you've got sort of an assembly to learn the agent, an assembly to learn the patient, and another to learn the relation. Uh, and then all of that stuff feeds into sort of the main assembly that assembles the, the proposition. Um, it works pretty well for the kinds of neural networks that they had at the time. Um, although when I read that, I, I always thought it was kind of a hack. I thought, surely you can't just like put these assemblies in there and probably the brain doesn't really work that way. The brain must have some much more elegant solution to this. Um, so that's what I always thought. Until three weeks ago, uh, when this article came out in the Proceedings from the National Academy of Sciences, a couple guys at the uh, psych department at Harvard, uh, Franklin and Green, did fMRI studies uh, looking at the left mid superior temporal cortex and through a bunch of clever experiments found the exact assemblies in the brain that actually do the thing that Hick was predicting they would do 30 years ago. So you've got this little red area here, it's your patient assembly, the blue area is your, uh, your agent assembly, and from that they're able to recognize uh, how people uh, recognize um, you know, sentences like the dog approached the man or the dog chased the man, that kind of thing. Um, so check that one out if you're interested, it's, uh, it's really neat. Um, so anyway, just to recap, uh, even though we can all do it, uh, language is actually very hard to do. Um, and second of all, uh, human capacity probably arises from some kind of special architecture or the way, the way the brain is wired. So if we want to do language understanding, the thing to do is to experiment with different architectures. So let's talk for a little bit about semantics. Uh, semantics is, if you don't know, it's just, you know, just deciding what things mean. How do you know what anything means? Um, so for a long time, uh, starting around the, the 1950s or so, we had uh, what was called the, the dictionary approach. Uh, and the dictionary approach just said you can define something by the necessary and sufficient features that would define that, that thing. Um, and this stuff got, got popular in the 1960s, but uh, this is also the primary way that people still do semantics these days when they're kind of doing you know, fudgy semantics. Um, so, so a classic uh, um, example in this, uh, semantics like to use the word bachelor for experimentation, maybe because they were bachelors, I don't know. Uh, so we have a bachelor here who's um, you know, got a rose and a fancy suit on. Another type of bachelor, the second sense of the word, uh, would be someone uh, would be a seal who is young and unmated. Um, two different senses of the word bachelor, so you need to know how do you tell one bachelor from the other bachelor. So the dictionary approach to this would say, oh, we kind of got cut off on the top there, but we have bachelor number one would match to, now these are what you call semantic markers or semantic primitives. And they're just things like, all right, it's a physical object that's living, it's human, it's male, it's adult, it's never been married. Uh, and bachelor number two would ma map to this other dictionary ent entity, which is an animal, it's a male, it's a seal, etc. Et you can take that stuff and put it into some kind of directed graph like this uh, that would define your entire lexicon that would tell you what everything means. And you could just traverse that graph and uh, do, your, do your semantics that way. Uh, another thing you might do this is sort of a, what we call a units representation. And that's where we've taken the various features, necessary and sufficient features, and <coughs> defined a unit for each of those. And then you just sort of take off the ones that, that work for that one. Um, you could also look at it as a matrix, as a, as a table, like this, like you see here. Uh, or you could also take all those features and make them basis vectors into some low dimensional space uh, and make a vector space representation and then plot all your different words in that vector space. So these three things are just three different transformations of essentially the same thing. But there are three ways that you'll hear people in deep learning and semantics talking about, um, talking about these ideas. So to, it's, to understand that they're, they're really just the same thing looked at in different ways. <coughs> so there are a bunch of problems with the dictionary approach. Uh, the main one is that the necessary and sufficient features uh, don't really seem to be necessary or sufficient. 
um, in the 1970s, uh, Eleanor Roche kind of kicked off this thing talking about uh, looking at prototypical examples where she found that if you take, for example, the concept of a bird, uh, people seem to think that a robin is a much more uh, better example of a bird than a finch or a penguin or something like that. And uh, the dictionary approach doesn't really tell you why there would be these differences in people's interpretations. So things don't really categorize quite so easily. Um, and so people like George Lakoff at Berkeley and Mark Johnson talked a lot about the metaphorical sort of core of language, that it's not just something that's added on to language, but really it's a fundamental part of how we understand each other. Uh, and Douglas Hofstadter has written quite a bit about sort of the analogic nature of language and the fact that we seem to do almost everything by analogies. And none of this stuff really fits very well into that dictionary-based approach. Um, another another uh, big person this was Charles Fillmore, also in Berkeley, uh, who pointed out lots of different edge cases. For example, uh, you know, we define a widow as someone with a, you know, a husband who has died, uh, but if that woman murdered her husband, would we still call her a widow? Uh, Fillmore seems to think that that wouldn't really do it justice. Uh, and so he has a lot of different edge cases like that. One of my um, favorite examples of this comes from Herb Clark here at, here at Stanford, uh, where he gives this example of Max went too far today and teapotted a policeman. Um, and the word teapotted doesn't seem to fit there in any kind of dictionary approach way. And yet this is a sentence that somebody could say in English, and if you had the right background and you had the right understanding, you knew Max and you knew his history and that sort of thing, uh, this could be a perfectly sensible sentence for somebody to say. Um, so these are all sort of the, the main problems with the, the dictionary approach. So while people were arguing about this, uh, some other people came up with some, some different ideas that we call the distributional approach. And that just means to just look at the words that are surrounding a word, and maybe a word can just be defined by the words that you find around it, by the lexical context. So in this case, I've taken uh, a window of just three words, um, which is much smaller than you would usually do. Uh, but you could just sort of go through your document, through your sentence, and look at the co-occurrences of those words. Put them in a table, like this is just a table of counts, where we've got the words we're interested in at the top, and then along the rows we've got the same words, but we call them context, context words. Uh, but then what we can do is take this table and do some kind of dimensionality reduction, like PCA or SVD, uh, so that these context words collapse down into um, some kind of latent context features, okay? So, this is just a, a, a weird example, but uh, you take like X3 here, and you can see that X3 scores pretty high on both fox and dog. So maybe X3 has something to do with something being a mammal or being a canine or, or something like that. Um, doesn't matter, the statistics kind of figure these things out for you. So that's the idea behind the whole distributional approach. Um, and so another way to look at this is you take this local representation that we had before, and you now replace it with a distributed representation, uh, where these x's don't necessarily mean anything that we uh, know about a priori. Um, but the features that we had before, something like something being young, uh, would get distributed among those various features. So that's called a distributed representation. Um, again, you can look at that as a vector space, and the nice thing with these latent features is that you can take a distributed representation and as your idea about it changes or you get in new information, you can tweak it around a little bit uh, in a particular context and sort of move it back and forth. And um, your ability to understand things in different contexts becomes a lot more fluid than it was with the other approaches. So uh, I'm going to skip now to deep learning. There's a lot of other stuff that sort of came in there. Um, but the great thing with deep learning was it gave us a new way to learn distributed representations using neural networks. Uh, first with Yasha Benjo in the early 2000s doing sort of neural language models. And then I'm sure you've all heard about uh, Tomas Rikolov's uh, word to vec and the uh, SIBO and SkipGram architectures. Um, and these are just different ways to take neural networks, learn from the data itself. You can learn the data as it comes in, so you don't have to have sort of like a predefined table of all and everything, you can just sort of keep learning things as new sentences come in or new ideas. Uh, you can also learn from sequences using architectures like recur uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, so that's very handy. Um, and finally, another thing you can do is you can learn from lots of additional context features. 
Okay, so not just other context words, but we could throw other things in there as well. For example, there are a lot of uh, studies lately with people including visual features, plotting visual features into the same representational space as uh, semantic features. Um, you can use parse structure. Uh, Richard Zucker here was doing a lot of stuff with recursive neural networks where you actually feed in a parse tree to a, a neural network and use that parse information as additional context. Um, also, just higher level abstractions from stuff that came before. So there might be interesting things that came before and you've learned some higher level abstraction of that and that can inform how you interpret uh, what's coming at you right now. That's sort of the general <laughs> idea with recurrent programs. So if we just go back to our uh, Herb Clark's example of Max went too far today and teapotted a policeman, um, as I was saying before, this is something where it doesn't seem like it should be a sensible sentence unless you have a bunch of contextual information. And so that Contextual information might come in a bunch of different ways. It might be some story or memory that you had about Max or you've abstracted certain ideas about Max. Uh, it might be a visual experience that you had and shared with this other person who's uh, maybe you've never actually talked about Max teapotting someone, but because you shared this same uh, visual experience, uh, you're now under, able to understand the sentence. It's a great story. Um, and, and the main point there is, is just that we can take language and we can add in all these contextual features that may come from different modalities, different ideas like abstractions, that sort of thing. There's a great story from Charles Fillmore uh, where he talks about a friend of his who was hanging out with some children who were five or six years old and uh, she pulled out a grapefruit and the children were like, oh, grapefruit. And then she began to peel it and sectioned it and started eating it and the children started saying, that's not a grapefruit, that's an orange. She said, no, 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 look, it's big and it's pink, it's a grapefruit. And the kid said, no, 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 a grapefruit, you cut in half and you eat it with a spoon. Uh, an orange, you peel in section like this. So the children had these different sort of experiential, contextual features that went into their definition of what an orange is and what a grapefruit is. And as they learn, as these different features come in, they see, oh, you actually can take a grapefruit and section it and eat it that way. Their conceptualization changes. Um, but so it's that contextual information that is very important to, to get at when you're doing understanding. So my point with, with this is just that for doing human capacity cognitive computing, uh, there's a huge potential for putting things into this context feature input space. Um, you know, we have five different senses. They've got God knows how many neurons like feeding into our understanding of things. Uh, that's a huge input space, and it's also a very sparse input space. So you've got this large sparse input that's going to be fully connected to all of the layers that are doing your interpretation. Um, and then you've got these complex assemblies. We don't even know exactly what the best assemblies are yet, but we have things like uh, RNNs. You need ways to, to maintain some kind of memory, which is what LSTMs and, and GRUs help you do. They help you take an abstraction or an idea that came much earlier uh, and remember it down the line uh, and forget it when you then need to. But the main point here is all of these things, uh, your sparse, uh, fully connected input and all these complex memory uh, assemblies require a lot of matrix multiplications, um, which you heard a good bit about in the last talk, so I won't go into it in, in much detail, but obviously the, the best solution that we have right now doing this kind of thing is using the power of GPUs. Uh, because using uh, CPUs with so many input features uh, would take you a very long time to, to train them all. Um, so just to kind of sum up, if we're going to do some kind of human capacity cognitive computing platform, it needs to be able to do a number of things. It has to handle context feature input from a bunch of different modalities and project those modality, uh, the, that, the, the interpretations from that input into some single representation space. Um, it also has to support all kinds of different architectures with specialized assemblies that would permit the recursion and embedding that we were talking about earlier and produce this discrete infinity phenomenon. Um, finally, you need a kind of fluid interpretation and understanding system where things can move around in your representation space depending on new information that comes in. Uh, and in order to do all these things, you need a lot of computational firepower. So uh, just to give a little plug, the Loop Cognitive Computing Platform is something that aspires to do this exact uh, human capacity understanding. It's a GPU-based appliance that we, uh, uh, we 
lease out to, to companies. And what it does is it learns from unstructured text data and then produces a structured representation from that. Uh, and understands concepts within the, the context of the domain that they are happening in. Um, and it does it mostly based on sort of the, these uh, principles that uh, I was just talking about. Um, so we'll just end it there. Uh, I'll put her parts up here since it's expiring. Um, but any questions? <laughs>